So the bottom line is why we're all here. It's, there's a shared concern about the impacts of alien species and, and the, the seriousness um, the, of, these, of these species. So we looked at the impact specifically for protected areas. And the reason is, if you open almost any research paper or any report, you're going to get statements like invasive aliens are the greatest threat to biodiversity, negative impact on biodiversity, and the second greatest threat to biodiversity, and you get these statements all the time. Um, and we should probably start writing papers with some other open statement. <laughs> so why protected areas globally? Well, protected areas are becoming the cornerstones of conservation. The world's landscape is getting transformed um, and within this landscape matrix you're getting these small pockets of, of natural habitat. There are now around 157,000 protected areas and about 16 million square kilometers of terrestrial, uh, terrestrial areas. At the same time, we've got this massive increase in <coughs> protected areas. We've got this explosion in, in research on biological invasions. And this comes from the Scopus um, database, where we've got, just with a string of keywords, more than 1,000 papers per year, I think in 2012. So at this stage, with the importance of protected areas, the knowledge that's coming out of research on biological invasions, it seems like an important time to assess what do we know and what does it mean. As far back as the 1920s, statements came out, and this was from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a powerful um, association publishing the journal Science, and they strongly opposed the introduction of alien animals and plants. Similar statement in 44 by the British Ecological Society. And then closer to home, the introduction of alien species should be religiously avoided, and this is in Kruger National Park. And then Bobby Golke, who was a, a member of the National Parks Board, wrote a paper in Transactions of the Royal Society state, uh, titled The Adulteration of Our Fauna and Flora. And in that paper he wrote that if alien species were introduced or allowed to, uh, allowed to expand within protected areas of national parks, the meaning of national parks, uh, there would be no meaning to national parks. So there's were very strong sentiments from a long time ago already. So we've developed an integrated uh, framework to try and assess the impacts of alien plant invasions in protected areas. Of course, the first thing you're going to say is we've missed a whole lot as we go through. Of course, there's a lot of literature that we haven't picked up. But we've also tried to find what we could that's been done in protected areas so that we can use these as examples for other um, areas in similar, similar situations. So we looked at species and communities, and this is one area where a fair amount of work has been done. Look at the species composition, community composition, abundance, and this is often done using biodiversity indicators. Often beetles and spiders are assessed, and then from this you can infer the impact that the alien species is having on the, on the, the habitat in that area. We found very little work on rare and threatened species, even though there's a, a lot of uh, statements that aliens are driving species to extinction, we actually found very little evidence for this in the published literature in general, but also in protected areas. One of the most important things and one of the reasons behind why a lot of protected areas are proclaimed is for these social ecological ecosystem services. And this has been fairly well studied in South Africa, water aspects, all aspects, um, word tourism and wilderness, and there's a range of services uh, from, from this uh, area. So, and not a lot that's been done in protected areas, but a lot of information out there on this. Biogeochemistry is a highly complex system. There's a lot of drivers, responders, there's integrated cycles. And to tease out what is actually happening below the ground uh, with these different chemi chemical um, processes that are impacting on below ground fauna and uh, flora is very difficult, but the, these, these cycles, if, if disturbed, have the potential to completely alter um, the landscape and to the point where it will never be possible to reverse um, some of these, these impacts. 
There's a fair amount of work done on aspects of ecosystem properties. The most work comes from fires, and probably one of the most important for protected areas. And there's some really dramatic examples um, across the world where we, where we find huge uh, changes due to fire, uh, changes in fire regimes. And I'll, I'll show you some fairly dramatic examples. And there's the economic impacts, direct costs, but also the, the cost of control. Most conservation organizations don't have enough money to fund themselves generally, let alone to spend a huge amount of money on expensive control programs. Uh, so these are things that really need to be taken into consideration when we're looking at the impact of plant invasion. So if we just start looking at some of the community work, the first work that we could find was in, in the 1970s in Theodore Roosevelt Island Nature Reserve in Washington. And they looked at the, the impact of uh, Japanese honeysuckle and even in mature natural forest it was able to inhibit the recruitment of large um, uh, climax forest and there were also English ivy that was able to suppress um, trees through shading and there's another fairly dramatic example from Florida Everglades National Park with Ligodium and the impacts are obvious in terms of the smothering, but another impact is that on the, you can see on the bottom right is that the, how the plants grow up into the canopy. And these areas do burn, so, uh, not very often, but they have low intensity fires at the ground level. Now you're getting fire ladders going up into the canopy, and, it's like, and you can see the, 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 the tops of those trees have been completely damaged, and eventually the, those small forested areas. Um, uh, collapse com completely. So you're getting a small islands within the, the Everglades that are slowly being tra transformed into these islands of uh, Nagodia. A lot of work has been done in South Africa. Um, Pramina is one of the, the best known examples in Shishu and Pelosi. And there's been a range of work done. There's been work done in spider assemblage has been shown to have negative impacts on abundance, diversity, estimated species richness, all of these have decreased in, in areas that have been highly uh, invaded. Decreases in small and large mammals, I was more surprised to find. Decre decreases in large mammals, um, I was even more surprised. And then we also all know the example, it's a well-known example of impact of chromolino changing the sex ratios of crocodiles through the shading of uh, nesting habitat. So cool, the cooler the, the nest uh, cha changes the, the, the whole sex ratio. So you may not pick that up immediately, but over time you're going to get these uh, biased populations. And then I was most surprised to find examples of uh, mega herbivores literally tanks that are getting displaced, like the, the one horned rhino. In, um, it's the greatest population has been displaced by two vines, Mycania and Mimosa, and it's a grassland specialist, and these grasslands are being completely invaded, and these plants are being displaced out of protected areas into marginal habitat. And they're already facing hard enough time from poaching, and now they've got no food as well. Um, we also find that the same effect from chromolino and black tano to shishu and velozi. And there's been reports of Lantana displacing sable antelope um, in, in Kenya. There's been some work done in Kruger looking at beetles and spiders. There were a range of indicators looked at. Most of the indicators that were assessed, there was no impact found. There was an impact in that beetle assemblages were significantly reduced. But since this work was done, this, this area which was surveyed has been uh, com almost completely killed by the cochineal. So the assumption we can make is that uh, because of the management of the cochineal, there's most likely pretty much no impact um, of prickly pear um, in the Kruger system. It's, a, it's a unsightly still, but the, the ecolo ecological impact is probably very, very little. An interesting impact was um, is the impact of mutualisms. So if you've got highly attractive flowers that are alien, they're going to attract 
uh, that can attract indigenous pollinator species to them, it means the visitation of those pollinators to indigenous species will be, will be a lot less. And over time, you're going to find uh, a, a, a gradual displacement of those indigenous flowering plants out of the landscape. And some of these species are priority plants in protected areas, or the, the parks are the last remnant habitat for them. And of course, if they get fall out of that system, um, they, it's one of the mandates of a protected area. So um, they're not fulfilling what they basically are supposed to. The ecological services, this is a global system. It's not something a protected area can solve within one area. But in different pockets, there are um, components that the, the parks can contribute to. And if we look at provisioning, those are your tangible uh, products. Some protected areas are specifically designated to maintain these tangible products that can be harvested over time. In parks in India, they're more cultural natural, national parks. And one of the reasons is that they have areas that are specifically allocated for food and fiber and fuel with collection. So they're playing a big role in many of the Indian national parks. Regulating, we've seen there's a lot of water on flooding um, and purification. And then supporting, this is really one area where uh, parks cannot play a big role, but need to contribute within those small areas for the pockets to maintain healthy systems. And then cultural services, many areas are cultural parks or um, religious parks, and they have uh, great value and aliens have been trying to impact some of those, those uh, cultural parks. And there's also the aspect of tourism or wilderness. And you can think on the top right, you've got a group of tourists paying a large sum of money to go into a, a wilderness area only to go and stare at, a, at a, a river full of piss there. You'll be surprised that people do know that they're aliens. They may get the wrong species, but they know it's alien, and they want to know why you're not doing anything about it and also that unlikely to come back. And at, at a few thousand rand per person per, na per night, it's not something you want to lose. Um, biogeochemistry, is a, like I said, is a complex system. It's, um, it's really very interesting, but it's highly complex. And it's difficult to tease out what, what is ac actually happening. And there's been a lot of work done by Joan Ehrenfels, and, um, but it's difficult to link across different systems. But there's some examples from Morella, from Hawaii's, Hawaii's uh, Volcanoes National Park. Soil nitrogen increased to 400% or by changes succession, increases alien earthworms, increases nitrogen rate, burial rates, and you get this invasion cycle, so it keeps driving its own invasion. In um, Australia, gamma grass increased fuel load by seven times and increased intensity by eight times and it forms these self-reinforcing loops. The same thing in inhibiting soil nitrification, promoting fire, uh, fire nitrogen loss, and um, these self-reinforcing loops. And how do you stop that once it's planted in? How do you manage for that? You get woodlands to herbaceous systems. Um, the same thing in Chichlui. In the US, which in the, a lot of national parks, you get fire systems that range uh, from one in 60 to one in 100 year cycles and they've gone down to one in three or one in five cycles. And that's a complete alteration, this uh, change the system. There's the famous quote, 137 billion spent per year in America. You have to read the paper, there's a lot of caveats in that, but it throws up a scare number. A huge amount of money spent in Africa, uh, and in South Africa, Cash and Mersey Island. The value to the country is around 550 million. But the, this is one of the most invasive, the loss about three times more. So you have to ask yourself the question, why? Doesn't make sense. Working for water, over time has been about 3.2 billion. But within sand parks, as a total, the figures I have probably need to get updated, nearly 400 million rand. There's just no ways that sand parks can find this money. And it, uh, sand parks is a well-resourced compared to many other conservation organizations, certainly across Africa. 
in Kruger, over the last couple of years, 100 million rand. It's again, there's no way that Kruger, even though it's the cash cow for the organization, can find this kind of money. Then there's two examples of um, complex interactions driven by feral pigs. In Hawaii again, pigs are a keystone alien species and they're the single biggest spread of aliens. And if you don't deal with these, these pigs, they open habitat, trans transport proper yules, and um, further invade in, in Malaysia, Peninsula Nature Reserve. The same thing, feral pigs. Um, you've got an undisturbed tropical forest, and this plant was called un unlikely to invade. But the pigs make light available, disturb soil, alters the forest, and um, <coughs> utilize that, and then they just evade further. So these are interactions between aliens. Um, and if we're to understand impacts of aliens, we need to understand all these interactions, and that's what, what makes it really complex. So there's many examples of threats. They're very severe examples, but it's slow to assess, it's difficult, and once it's detected, it's often too late. So, where do we stand on the invasion pathway? We need to understand and quantify impacts because there's going to come a time where uh, funders are going to ask for well, where's, the, where's, the, where's the, the evidence. Doesn't it won't be good enough to show them a patch of aliens so that looks bad, we need to control. They're going to ask for, uh, for that evidence. So, thank you.